Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning, and I'm, I thank God so much for such a beautiful day that he has given us as we go to the changes of the seasons, and being an old country boy, I used to love this time of year because it's the time of year that didn't have to work so hard and didn't have to work in the sun as much as I had all summer long, so I really used to appreciate this time of year. But it's good to see each and every one of you, and I appreciate the elders and deacons and ministers and the members of this congregation for inviting me to be here. And I hope that during the time that we spend together in the next few days, that all of us can get stronger in the most holy faith and that all of us can, at some point in time, um, just feel good about being a Christian in the time in which we live. Make no mistake about it, and I'm sure that it's the same with your your minister and your shepherds as they are trying to lead the church, that we don't try to be populist. That if we were trying to be populist preachers or popular preachers or speak the popular language of what the uh, current spin is in America, then we would uh, be on the progressive bandwagon, so to speak, as things change faster than we intend for them to change or that we want them to change and in directions we don't care for them to change. That's what all of us see happening right now. What I have to do is, rather than just looking at the news and getting frustrated and disappointed and disgusted about the things that I see, what I've got to do is what the Lord has always wanted his children to do. When the Lord asks about the popular opinion about him out in the marketplace, in Matthew chapter 16 that I'll probably quote three or four times before I leave here uh, on Thursday, the Lord asked the apostles when he came to the coast of Caesarea in Philippi, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? What are they saying about me out there? What are they saying in the marketplace? What are they saying around the place where you buy your food? What are they saying at the place where you buy your fish or where you deal with the people or where the Sanhedrin meet and where other folks are meeting? What are they saying about me out in the marketplace? They had to tell the Lord, well, Somebody said that you are Elijah, come back to life, or Jeremiah, come back to life, or some other prophet, come back to life. They would rather believe, just as we see happening in the marketplace today. I was watching a program the other day, and they were saying that, well, they got to say that creation demands a creator, and life demands a life giver. So when they looked at it, all the scientists, the people with prefixes and suffixes on their name, the smart people, who are smarter than we are, they said, well, here is what we figure. We figure that some ancient aliens came to, to uh, this area or to this universe, and they realized that this is a planet that could have life. So the ancient aliens planted life, and then they went and hooked some rocket ships to the moon, and they pulled the moon into the orbit of the Earth so that the moon could have influence on the Earth, and that's how life began on earth. I was sitting there watching this foolishness saying, boy, what a bunch of dummies. They would rather believe something that ridiculous than to believe what the Bible says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when you've made your mind up that there is no God, and when you've made your mind up that there is no creator, and that life is accidental, we just crawl from under the primordial ooze, which is what they're teaching our children in the public schools today, then you believe anything. So when Jesus is around there doing stuff like, you know, ordinary stuff like raising folks from the dead, you know, making folks who never walked before in their life walk, making folks who've never seen anything in their life see, uh, cleansing devils out of people, running them into pigs and all kinds of stuff, like ordinary stuff that everybody's seen their whole lives, the best thing they can come up with is, no, he's not the Messiah. He's not the Son of God. He's not the promised one. He's not the one that we are to wait on. He's just probably one of those old dead prophets come back to life. Well, the Lord knew that. God don't ask for information because God knows everything. God asks for confirmation. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And that's what, he, that's what he's doing for each and every one of us. There is nothing going on in America and around the world that surprises God. There is nothing that God didn't expect. As a matter of fact, we go back, thank you, brother, we go back to what Paul did and what Paul said when he was writing to Timothy. He had left Titus at Crete, Timothy at Ephesus, and this 
old, battered, beat-up gospel preacher is sending to both of these young men letters that will help them and strengthen them in what they've got to do during Paul's demise and Peter's demise and, and James and the other apostles as they move off the scene. So the Apostle Paul told us 2,000 years ago about the dangerous times that are coming. I don't know why we act so surprised. Why are we surprised when we were given a forewarning of these things 2,000 years ago? That men would be without natural affection, that they would be truce breakers, that they would be disobedient to parents, that they would destroy the institution of marriage, that they would not have integrity, would not follow principles, and would not have a biblical standard of ethics. What, what in the world is surprising about this? But we were told this 2,000 years ago. So the fact of the matter is, when Jesus came before the apostles, there at the coast of Caesarea in Philippi, the Lord's not asking them to tell me something I don't know. There is nothing God doesn't know. Because God is all-powerful. God is omnipresent, and God knows everything. So God is asking, I want y'all to confirm for me that you have heard these things, that you know what they are saying. And can you imagine the influential, piercing eyes of the Son of God looking at every one of those men after he asked them that question? Who do men say that I am? And he's looking at them. And all of them promptly started looking at each other to see who's going to be the person to give the bad news that they're not saying you're the Messiah. They're not saying you're the Son of God. They're not saying that you're the promised one. They're not saying that you're the redeemer. They're not saying that you're the one that came to save our souls and our sins and to bring us back in reconciliation to God. They're saying that, well, uh, you're Jeremiah or, or somebody else may have said with the head down, Elijah, and somebody else probably said looking away from the Lord or John the Baptist. Then he called them back to attention the same way he does us. What do you say? What do you say? What say ye? Who do you say that I am? And can you imagine that moment of silence then? Because, no, don't tell me what folks are saying. What do you say? What do they hear from you? What do they see from you? What do they know from you, from your behavior and the way you conduct yourself? Peter put his foot in his mouth many times, but this was one of his better days. Peter stood up and said, you're the Christ. The son of the living God. And can you see a little smile come on the Lord's face as he looks at Peter, his rock, the one that he's, he, that, that he's going to have stand on the day of Pentecost, the one who's many times going to have to take the lead when the brethren don't know which way to go. He said, blessed art thou, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee. You didn't hear this from the folks out there running their mouth in the marketplace and gibbering and jabbering around the high priest and the priest and the Levites and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the lawyers and the scribes. No, you didn't hear it from any of them because all of them are too ridiculously arrogant to say what you just said. That I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. The Lord is not saying that there was some direct sin to Peter at that moment for Peter to stand and talk like a robot. What he's saying is, from what, what God did from the very beginning in the confirmation of his son, when he was baptized by John, when Jesus walked up and John <clears throat> was saying, is this the one, or do we wait on another one? John who was the forerunner, <clears throat> and who had done his job, had opened up, had baptized unto repentance, bringing many of the apostate Jews back to a better relationship with their God in preparation for the Lord's event and advent. John looks at him and wonders, is this the one, or do I wait on another? And when John understands and realizes in his heart and understanding who he's talking to, Jesus said, baptize me. Can you see John stepping back because God knows your mind? Remember when, 
when Abraham's wife, Sarah, God said, what you laugh for? I didn't laugh. God said, yes, you did. Yeah, you did. I watched you laugh. I knew you laughed. I saw you laugh. And she said, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. Don't you know that God could look in John the Baptist's heart and he could see that moment of doubt and he could also see that moment when he got it. John bows and he says, I am not worthy to tie your shoes. I can't even tie your shoes. No matter what I've done, there is nothing that I have done in my ministry and my baptizing that qualifies me to tie even the shoes of the Son of God. Jesus said, baptize me, John. No, Lord, I'm not doing it. Jesus said, baptize me, John. And I, can't you see, what we've got to do is make, realize that Jesus is perfect humanity and perfect divinity, but he is man. He is humanity. Can you see Jesus change his tone of voice? John, baptize me. We've got to fulfill all righteousness. If I'm going to save your race, if I'm going to save you, the human race, I've got to dot every I, cross every T, and do everything the prophet said I had to do until it is finished. You baptize me, John. Baptize me, John. And John baptizes the Lord. The Lord rises, and the Godhead appears. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father in the person of his voice. Can you hear the voice of God booming so God can let John know and confirm, this is the one John. You don't have to wait on another. This is my beloved son. This is my son, John. I'm pleased with my son, John. The Holy Spirit in the person of a dove comes down to confirm, I'm with them. We are in communion, common union. I'm in common union with the second in the Godhead and sets on his shoulder in, in communion with the sun, and the sun there in the water, the Godhead that created the world, the Godhead that was creating redemptive religion, and Jesus is there to be baptized and save our souls from sin. So when Jesus asked them, who do they say that I am? And John made that confirmation. You're the son of God. The Lord said, Blessed art thou, you will be blessed. God will be with you because of what you just said. And man didn't reveal this unto thee. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, this truth that you have just stated, the same truth that every one of us have got to state, and it was not easy in John's world. John eventually had his head. I want y'all, you see, we get caught up one of the reasons why so many children today are so messed up, they play these games, you can blow people up, you can shoot their heads off, you can chop their arms off, you can cut their legs off, then you can push the restart, and the legs magically go back on, the arms magically reappear, the head magically reappears, and they start the game all over again because they're not living in reality, and many of them are not living in reality. But the reality was that John, because of a woman's salacious dance, his head was severed from his body. That was no game. That was no game. That poor man, that good preacher, that obedient servant of God was drugged out like an animal with his head laid down on the ground and a swordsman removed his head from his body, put it on a charger and served it like it was the head of a pig. That's the reality of it. Why? Because he was God's obedient servant. John couldn't weigh out the positives and the negatives, the, well, what might happen, what might not happen, uh, uh, what's in my best interest, what's not in my best interest. John had to obey. He had to obey. Simple as that. He had to do what God commanded him to do. And so with Peter and the apostles. And when the Lord looked at them on that day, when they made that confession, and Peter made that confession that he was the son of God, he says, upon this rock, this truth, I will build my church. And even though they're going to send me to the Hadean realm as prophesied for three days, it won't stop me from building my church. My church will be built. It will be established. It will flourish, just as Daniel said it will come into fruition and come into existence. Jesus said this to them. 
And what the Lord said, I whatsoever, and I will give y'all the keys to the kingdom. You're going to initiate this truth, this gospel of my divinity and the church. You're going to open the door. You're going to be the first to say what mankind has wanted to hear and waited on all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. The things that Moses couldn't look upon, Abraham couldn't look upon, the things that none of the prophets knew, they saw a mystery, but you're going to tell what the mystery is. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I will give you legislative authority. You will have the authority after the baptism measure of the Holy Ghost, which he promised to them, you will give those laws and what you say, what you and others say when y'all preach shall be bound in heaven as those laws, the doctrine that I want folks to hear. I want y'all to think about this story that we've heard and this, this uh, incident that we've heard so many times in our life. I look around this room and I'm looking at folks probably been in the church the majority of their lives. I'm looking at a room full of Bible scholars all of y'all know the Bible. There is not one scripture that I'm going to quote this week that you haven't heard taught. You have good ministers. You have good elders. You have good teachers and deacons. So it's not about me bringing you something new. What we do when we gather is what the Bible, what God, what the Lord wants us to do, and that's provoke one another to good works, to better works, to exhort one another, to encourage one another, uplift one another, to revive and restore and rejuvenate one another because the world wants to beat you down. The world wants to beat you down because you are God's children. They want you to disappear. They want your voice muted. They want you away from the marketplace, and they don't want anybody listening to anything you've got to say. So there is an orchestrated, concerted um, um, uh, uh, initiative to close your mouths and to mute you because you actually believe in this old Bronze Age book that is so irrelevant in today's marketplace. You actually believe, your whole big bunch of dummies, that somebody made dirt get up and walk. You actually believe that somebody split the Red Sea and folks walked through on dry ground. Oh, boy, I, I was sitting one time in a meeting in the House of Representatives, and a Vanderbilt professor with a whole bunch of prefixes and suffixes on her name sat there and told us how stupid we were to believe in the Bible. Of course, I had to say a few things to her before she got out of there. And she didn't get out of there not knowing one of those people who believe in the Bible and that they weren't scared of her and letting her know how ridiculously ignorant she was. The bottom line is, when the Lord spoke to the apostles, he's speaking to you the same way today. What do you say? Who do you say that I am? There are too many of us that are apologizing for being Christians around the country today. There are too many of us that are silent around the country today because of our Christianity. There are too many of us that compromise and have ideas and whose we are and what our responsibilities are. There are too many of us that have thrown up our hands and say, well, you know, well, it's too far gone, it's too this, it's too that, it's too rotten, it's too nasty. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, you can't say you believe Acts 2.38, Romans 6, 1 through 6. You, say you, you can't say you believe certain things and don't believe. If the Lord told me, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. If the Lord told me, if I am with you, who can be against you? If I'm your friend, who can be your enemy? If, the, if God has, has made that truth evident to me, why in the world would I be bothered about anything anybody's saying in the marketplace? I wouldn't be bothered at all. I would do the same thing that those of you who are in the military, have been in the military or in corporate America or in academia or in medicine, when you are faced with a problem and you focus on the solution, not the problem. 
You focus on what you're going to do about it, not the enemy. What your response is, what your stand is, and not the, the prowess and the, the power of the enemy, but what your response is. That's what we as Christians have got to do, and that's what the Lord is saying. What do you say? When the Lord sat down on that obscure hill, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, which is recorded arguably the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. It's been called the sermon that changed the world. When the Lord sat down, he didn't even, the, the, the Holy Spirit didn't even call it. You know, when I was growing up, you had Miller's Hill, and you had Thompson's Hill, and you had this hill and Broken Hill and, and that hill. The, the Holy Spirit didn't even tell us the name. I bet you a dollar against a bullfrog, as my grandfather used to. Paul used to say that that hill had a name, but it wasn't important. The only thing important was the Lord sat down and talked. With the natural acoustics of the Sea of Galilee behind him, he sat down and preached the greatest sermon that has ever been preached, the sermon that changed the world. Within that sermon, my brothers and my sisters, the Lord said, you're the light of the world. You are the light of the world, his people, his disciples, those who believe in him, believe in God, and believe in his word. You are the light of the world. You illuminate the world. You show the world the way. The world is not to show us the way. We are to show them the way. The Lord said, if I be lifted up from the earth. All right, that's a definitive statement made by the Son of God. If I be lifted up from the earth. He didn't say I might, I could, I ought to be, I should be. He said I will, I will. If we lift up the Son of God, you telling me that the Son of God, the Word of God, that God says will not return to him void. You're telling me that when a group of Christians, unafraid of the devil's messengers, who make God's word louder than the devil's word, who make God's soldiers stronger than the devil's soldiers, who makes God's soldiers and people more courageous than the devil. You're telling me that anything the devil can do can overcome that? No, it cannot. It cannot. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Is the Lord saying everybody's going to be saved? No. But he's saying what will happen when you stand, you make an impact on the final decision as to the way this world is going to go and what is going to happen because you shine light in darkness. Make no mistake about it. Light destroys darkness. I know Alabama played Tennessee yesterday. And Tennessee won, right? <laughs> Y'all laughing. <laughs> Well, anyway, Alabama blew Tennessee out yesterday. The bottom line is, if you had taken that huge stadium, turned all the lights out in that stadium, all the lights out in three blocks, no light, you can't see your hand in front of you. Somebody go to the 50-yard line and strike one match. You can see it from anywhere in that stadium. One match. One match. Because light destroys darkness. Every time one of us stand like the Lord told us to stand, when Paul talked to the brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 58, he knew he wasn't going to be alive very long. He knew that martyrdom was right around the corner. He knew that his voice would be silenced. He knew that. He understood that. As a matter of fact, sometime I think Paul looked forward to it. He said, I'm in a twix between. I kind of want to go home, but I know y'all need me here right now. So when Paul said that, Paul knew that eventually the voice of those powerful men, those powerful 12 men, with, and also with Paul born out of due season, that all of their voices would be silenced. He knew this. This is why he said to those brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What are you saying, Paul? Paul said, what God requires of you is not to run. What God requires of us is compromise, capitulation, and surrender. Where do we see anywhere in the scripture where God's people have ever surrendered? Where God's people have ever run, quit, 
given up the fight. Said it's too hard. It's too far gone. We can't save it. I tell folk, and you'll hear me say this at least two or three times before I leave your pulpit. God put, whooped a number on me. Because as I got older, I was one of those throwing up my hands angry. I sat on the floor of the house and listened to men say stuff that, that's awful about the killing of children, about the institution of marriage, about what's right and wrong, about the scriptures, about God, about the so-called separation of church and state and all that other foolishness and lies that are being pushed in the marketplace today. And I was one of those who back at, at, in the early 90s said, you know what, this might be too far gone and I'm just sick of fighting with folks. Then God put whooped the number on me. As daddy used to say, he gave me grandchildren. And when I had that little girl, the first one, holding on to my finger and looking me in my eyes, I said to her, baby, I'm going to do everything I can so you have the same blessings and that you have the same freedoms and you have the same rights and you have the same opportunities that I had. I got back in the fight. My voice was strengthened. Now, we all have to ask ourselves, as I look around this room at seasoned Christians, some of y'all probably fought in wars, been, who shot and been shot at, who paid for houses, raised children, grandchildren, probably some of you great-grandchildren. When I look around this room, what I'm looking at is the cream of the crop of God's kingdom. And what you've got to make up your mind is, if God gave us this, George Washington strapped a canoe, uh, a cannon on a canoe. Go study your history. And, and, and they rode the cannon out on something maybe a little bit bigger than a canoe, but they called it a canoe. And, and with one shot, they sank a 16-gun British frigate. George Washington said, God obviously intends for this to be a country. Now, when you think about it, there are countries with buildings 2,000 years old. We're just 200 years old as a nation. 200 years old. We are bottled babies in the world of nations. But yet, the most powerful, most impressive nation on the planet Earth, the most evenly distributed wealth in the history of the world, there's never been a middle class. America created the middle class. When you think about what has happened, did we do it our, on our own? Was God involved? Did we not put in God we trust on our money? Did we not teach our children? And I remember doing it in Miss Rowley's class, first grade, 1956, Dunn Avenue School. I had never done it before, but it was the most proud day of my life. Even in the days of the issues that we had in this country, God was always there. Our problems, our issues, our foolishness, our ignorance, our mistakes have been solved by two documents. The greatest document ever written by man, the American Constitution, in concert with the greatest document ever written, the Word of God. And even though we've made some egregious mistakes in our history, we have corrected them by turning back to God. So on that day that I put my hand over my heart and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, you know the rest of the pledge, but a lot of kids don't because they don't require it in the schools anymore. A lot of children don't have any allegiance to the flag. They don't have any allegiance to the country. They don't have any allegiance to the Constitution. They don't have any allegiance to the military. They don't have any allegiance to the church. They don't have any allegiance to the Bible they have no allegiance to your traditions or your morality. What are you going to do about it? Because that's exactly what the Lord was asking the apostles. What are you going to do about it? Who do men say that I am? They say you're John the Baptist. What are you going to do about it? Who do they say that I am? They say you're Jeremiah. What are you going to do about it? They say you just want to dead prophets. What are you going to do about it? And that's what the Lord is asking. Every one of us, those of us that he sent to change the world, when the Lord sent us out to go and preach the gospel to the whole creation, that good news is that the Lord has said every plant, 
Every plant, every religious system, every doctrine, every belief, every dogma, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. God doesn't say might be rooted up, could be rooted up. We'll talk about rooting it up. He said it shall be rooted up. When you think about all these systems that violate God today that are being propagated on the American public, the place where in, in Nashville, more Bibles are printed in Nashville than anywhere else on the planet. Where right now, just as we are here in Tuscumbia, that men and women are meeting all over this country to sing praises to the name of God in a way that there is nowhere else on the planet. Folks say possibly India and possibly Africa, but in America, we are the leader. So the Lord said, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do when folks say that I am not God, that God is dead, that we don't need to have God in our schools? Remember when school started, and I can remember in Miss Beasley's class, by the second grade, I had learned how to read well enough to be the kid to come up and to read the Bible verse in front of the class. And could, could speak well enough to be the kid that leads to prayer from time to time. Y'all remember those days? They don't exist anymore. What we hear now are complaints from teachers of being fired because they read a Bible verse. Coaches for being fired because they led a prayer. And these are the changes that the Lord was talking about. He says, these are plants that shall be rooted up. The deal has always been, if you fight, I'll fight with you. Paul said to the brethren in Romans chapter 12 and verses 2, Paul said, be not conformed, not conformed. Too many Christians are selling out, conforming to keep a job, to keep a house, to keep a way of living, to keep a lifestyle. Selling out. Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul or renew your mind. The so-called majority that is moral has to arise again and be the type of people that let, let folks know who God is and what God wants from each and every one of us. Here is something I want you to keep this in mind. When Jude was writing, uh, when the book of Jude was written, and he said, Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful to me to write unto you, and notice what he said, exhort you, encourage you, push you, try you, pride you, call you, whatever he has to do to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. He said, which was once delivered for the saints. In essence, Jude said, we have to earnestly contend for the faith. God never told you to run from the devil. What do we see where God told us to run from the devil? God never told us to run from the devil. God told us to put the devil on the run. He said, if you resist him, he will flee from you. When we stand, when we speak, when we act as God's children, when we show unflinching love, devotion, and faithfulness, when the, when the soldiers, the, the high priest soldiers were coming to get Jesus, the Lord didn't need Peter to grab a sword slinging it. The Lord saying to Peter, man, put that thing down. You're a fisherman. You're not a swordsman. Yeah, cut the man's ear off, trying to cut his head off and cut off his ear. The Lord got to pick the man's ear off and up and put the ear back on. Put that thing down, boy. What you doing? You're going to die right here. They're going to kill you because you, don't, you can't defend yourself with a sword. You're a fisherman. What the Lord needed from Peter was not him wildly slinging the sword. What the Lord needed from Peter was for him to stand there, clench his teeth, look those devils dead in the eye, and say, I'm with him. Whatever you do to him, you do to me. That's all the Lord needed from Peter. He didn't need him to hit. He didn't need him to ball his fist up. He didn't need him to swing. He didn't need him to pick up the sword. The Lord said, don't y'all understand something? I'm the son of God. If I wanted to, I could call legions of angels. They'd come down here and wipe everybody out. 
if that's what I wanted to do. He said, but I came to die. I came to die for your sins. I came to die for the reproach. I came to die for the violated justice. I came to reconcile the relationship between you and God. That's what God needs from each and every one of us. That's why Paul said, and we'll talk about this again, Paul said what Peter had not done. Peter was depending upon the power of Peter. The Lord said, Peter, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no, Lord, I'm your rock. I'm your rock, Lord. No, not me, not Peter. I'll die for you. The Lord said, Peter, you're going to deny me. No, Lord, not me. I'm staying steadfast. Uh-uh, don't do it. Will not move. Lord said, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you are going to have denied me three times. You're going to say you don't even know me. Now, how many of us could the Lord make that prediction that somebody's going to say something, and instead of us saying, no, that's not right, that's not right. No, the Bible says this. No, that's not right. The Bible is God's inerrant word. No, that's not right. God is eternal. No, that's not right. The Lord is Alpha and Omega. No, that's not right. The Lord died and purchased his church with his blood. That's not right. How many of us, when the time for us to say those things, we do what Peter did? We just say, well, no. No, I wasn't with him. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Your speech betrays you. You speak that same old Ebonics he preaches and speaks. No, I wasn't. I wasn't with him. No, no. Bible says, and he cursed and swore. In essence, what the Lord, when the Holy Spirit revealed this book, the Apostle Paul said those things written aford time, and all of that's a four-hour time, but he's speaking of, especially of the Old Testament. But all of these things that are written before our time, or our birth, or our advent on this earth, are written for our learning. Why does God tell us of Peter's egregious failure? Why does the Lord tell us that Thomas said, man, I don't believe that boy rose from the dead. If I can stick my hand in his chest, or if I can feel those nail holes, I might believe it right now. Uh-uh, no, no, no. I just, I just, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. The Lord didn't have to tell us that because all of those men straightened up, got strong, and did good. God didn't have to tell us that the young man that stood before Goliath with a stone and, and fell a nine-foot giant is also the same man that did the terrible sins he did with Bathsheba. God didn't have to tell us, but God tells us to let us, let us know that when we take our eyes off of him and we lose the strength that he gives us by our faith, and when the Hebrews were ready to quit, the Hebrew writer wrote, that without faith, without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For they that come unto the Father must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What time am I supposed to stop? Fifteen? That's, I thought so. What I hope and pray for all of us in the time in which we live, there are folks trying to make you go away. They're trying to make you disappear. They're trying to say that men and women don't sit in church together anymore. That you don't see folks who have st stood for the Lord for generations anymore. That you can't raise a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That you can't preach the truth without addition or subtraction. And that you can't be a Christian in these times because you're on the wrong side of history. We're going to talk about this this week, and I would hope and pray that all of us understand that if America is going to be saved for our children and our grandchildren, that it's our responsibility to do.